There we go. Okay, welcome, welcome Yvonne, welcome Jamie, welcome everyone who's joining us. We are very excited that you're with us tonight. This is the very second ever Connie cast and I have a wonderful guest with me tonight and we're gonna have them introduce themselves in just a minute. I just wanna remind you that on the right of the screen is a text box so you can Feel free to text in there, put questions, comments. And as we get into the discussion, we'll go ahead and put some of the questions up on the screen. And if people would like to join in on the conversation, we have an empty chair and you can come live if you'd like to add a comment or a question. Hope you're warm and cozy and comfortable wherever you're at. And tonight's topic is food addiction and recovery. An amazing topic, one of my absolute favorites, and I'd like yeah. to introduce our guest tonight, Jamie Fivecoat. Welcome, welcome. How are you this evening? Doing really well, thanks. Good. You look wonderful. So tell me uh, and all of our listeners about yourself and your interest in this topic. Okay. Um, so I'm Jamie Fivecoat. I'm a... Um, a rural eye gastric bypass patient from 2003. And so I've, food is an issue that I've had my whole life. Um, obviously had gone through all the yo-yo diet processes and been on every single diet that was out there until 2003 when I had gastric bypass surgery. And that worked amazingly for me. I got really wrapped up in a the addiction concept of food real early after having surgery when um, when we started talking about the difference between mind hunger and being hungry and where mind hunger was all that was that was really what was left and this desire to eat even though you didn't feel any physical hunger at, at, at that time and so it was kind of wondering about it later I ended up having to deal with addiction with alcohol as a result of there again a little bit of because of the the surgery because anybody who's had a ruin why realizes that drinking becomes almost like taking an iv and um i did deal with it to the point where um i, be, I tend to become an advocate so i work with the obesity action coalition i um have worked in the obesity community for years um then when I dealt with my addiction, I became an advocate there, and I now facilitate a smart recovery meeting. And smart recovery deals with all addictions, not just with um, with substance abuse, such as alcohol and drugs and food, uh, but any process addictions and things along those lines. So I've studied it an awful lot. Um, I won't claim to be an expert, but I sure have a, a, an awful lot of experience in the in both the recovery process and in being addicted. That's awesome. And you and I had the pleasure of meeting several years ago yeah, yeah. at, yeah, at what conference yeah, the first was time that? I think it was at an ASMBS meeting. In MBS, yes, and we just clicked right away. And we have a lot in common. We both are very strong believers in recovery from whatever. And I know Yvonne is too. So Yvonne, share with everybody a little bit about you and your interest in this topic. Well, my story is a lot like Jamie's. Uh, I just started a little earlier because I had a gastric bypass, RNY, in 2001. And um, I, I also call myself a Carney baby because I saw Carney Wilson on TV and decided 15 minutes later that I would get the surgery. Um, I started blogging about addiction i believe in 2005 maybe 2007 at the latest and when i did oh my god it was like first who the hell are you <laughs> and who, who do you think you are and don't you know there's no such thing as food addiction and i beg to differ because um you know i i feel very very strongly that uh, a much larger part of us are are addicted to food than they actually admit to the few that do admit it um, and I just believe that if we don't talk about it, uh, you know, my, I have several coined phrases and one of them is that you, you can't fix what you don't acknowledge. And until we acknowledge whatever it is, we cannot fix it. And it's a major problem. And 
for those who think that there is no such thing as withdrawal, I have a great link to um, when Oprah did her thing. They show a woman going through withdrawal when they took all the junk food away. And it is physical, cramps, throwing up, just like drugs and alcohol withdrawal, just different. And um, so I, um, I ended up starting to volunteer because when I had surgery, there was no aftercare. There was nobody around. And so I decided to be there to try to help. But there were a few people, you know, like Barbara Thompson, for instance, was one of the very few that was around. And she helped me. So I decided I needed to help, too. And luckily, I didn't see another post-op for three years, so I didn't know that you could even regain. I just assumed. So I started bariatricgirl.com. And I have a Facebook page under Bariatric Girl and a blog. And I answer questions from post-op and pre-op just all day long. And I am absolutely passionate about food. I think that's you know, it's interesting. When when I go to some of the professional conferences and the physicians and the psychologists and the psychiatrists and the RDs and you know they talk about food addiction and there's a huge controversy over this topic. And yet when I'm with patient groups and I ask how many of you think of yourself as a food addict, honestly, almost every hand in the room goes up. What do you guys think about that? Jamie, so well, you know, no. Go, Jane. Okay. Yes. Um, I don't think there's any question about whether or not there's there's food addiction, and I and I say that for a number of reasons. Number one, because I experience it. Number two, because I have a lot of people who have come through smart meetings specifically for food addiction, and we define addiction as being a a habitual behavior that has become dysfunctional in your life. So that that particular behavior is has, is creating relationship issues, health issues, whatever types of things. Maybe it's taking up all your time, and people are coming through with with where food has become so dysfunctional for them, they realize that they need to to begin to deal with it. But the other the other place where I've done an awful lot of study is in the neuroscience spots, and when you see and we've seen at some of our OAC conventions. The um, where the brains get lit up the same way that uh, drugs will light up the brain with fat, salt, and sugars. And um, uh, one of my favorite authors uh, in the addiction area was a um, David Lent from uh, John Hopkins University, a neuroscientist who does, wrote a really neat book called The Compass of Pleasure. He describes various types of addictive behaviors in the, in the book, from drugs, alcohol, food being one of them, and does a fantastic job of, of describing the pleasure path and how food is attacking it and hitting it. And um, it talks about neuroscience, but it was it's it's very well done, and a layman like myself can read it and and understand it. And so. From that standpoint, I don't think there's a whole lot of question whether or not there are addictive aspects to certain types of foods. Obviously, not all foods, but for certain types of foods, will create addictive type of behaviors. Well, you know, I mean, I I think it's very obvious that we eat because you know we we have um, we we want to avoid the negative emotions, and and then on top of that, you know, then you know uh, our disease is. We're filled with guilt and shame, and it's hard to handle yet another label because we had the obesity label and the, all that. And you know, by the very nature of the disease, we avoid the negative emotions. So that means we don't want to think about it, or we may not even be aware of it or believe in it. And like I will repeat, you know, because we can't fix what we don't acknowledge. So I think we have to call it something, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, it's that definition of insanity, like I mentioned last month, that you know, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome, you know, and the same thing about if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you've always gotten. But, you know, my my uh, definition, which I know Connie's heard before, is of addiction, is uncontrolled use despite negative consequences. And, um, you know, I've seen people Say that, that again. uncontrolled use despite negative consequences. And I've seen people come into AA that get sober from drugs and alcohol and switch to food and then come to get weight loss surgery. Then I've seen people that have weight loss surgery that switch to you know, drugs, alcohol, gambling, sex, shopping, exercise, 
I used to say and or, but some people just do all of it, you know. And I am so grateful that alcohol just didn't blow my skirts up. It just didn't. And so, um, and I, I also am a very firm believer. What you said, Jamie, I really want to t touch on that about, you know, how they talk about the R and Y people. We absorb it so much faster. But I want to bring up a point on that. You know, if you took a, let's say, a um, 100 pound woman that never drank, a lightweight, and you take a 300 pound man that drinks all the time. Well, just because that 100 pound woman gets drunk, you know, because she's a lightweight, doesn't mean she's going to be an addict. You see what I'm saying? So because R and Y, you know, it absorbs so quickly, that doesn't mean we'll be, because it, it, it does to me, but I didn't become an alcoholic. You know, I've got other problems, but, but you know what I'm saying? I think that does a disservice because some people, I have one friend that thinks she's an alcoholic because she got R and Y. Get that? Because she got the R and Y, she's an alcoholic. And then we've got others, you know, that think, well, it's only the R and Yers, but the people I talk to all the time, it's all across all surgery types. Just like, you know, all surgery types can succeed or not. Same thing with the addiction. And and God, we need help with therapy. And, and well, first we just need the general consensus that it's real, right, Connie? <laughs> and and I want to say to Connie too, because. I have so long wanted to open up the, the conversation between the professionals and the people, the lay people like us, because we know what's going on because we live it every single day. And to get somebody that we can talk to like you, Connie, means so much to me because there's just a lot of doctors we can't talk to, won't talk to us. You know, so Thank you. I appreciate you so much. It, it, this is a wonderful opportunity to be able to have and engage in this conversation. I do want to mention something that you were talking about, and that's like like the transference of addictions and stuff. I uh -huh. know for myself, and I have learned that I really don't think I transferred from food to alcohol. I think I had an addiction to both going on prior to even having the ruin why. But when I took the sugar away, when I took the, the, the large carbohydrates and the fats away from my diet, Alcohol was left, and unfortunately, I tolerated the ability to drink it. It didn't cause dumping syndrome for me, at least not, no. not at least not immediately. And so, uh, well, all the other stuff does. It still does, even after after all these years. But the uh, alcohol didn't, and so I just started to abuse it, and it you know, got in the way. A couple of but, thoughts that I had while you guys were talking is um, I love your, your definitions and I love the fact that you, you guys want to get the dialogue going with other professionals because a lot of times if there's not research-based evidence to prove what we're talking about, then it doesn't exist. But we know it exists. So I love the yeah. fact that everybody is willing to open up that dialogue and we need to get the professionals involved. A definition I really like of addiction too is that if you know something's a problem, whatever it is, if it's shopping or hoarding or gambling or drinking or food or whatever it is, you know it's causing problems in your life. You want to stop, but you can't. That's addiction. Exactly. You know, so all yeah. the definitions we've said are true and there's so much, Jamie, you talked about the brain imaging and the brain knowledge. There's so much on that. And I love it when they say an addiction is like having a hijacked brain because it's almost like your your rational capabilities just leave you. Jamie, you were going to say something else. Yeah, it kind of went in and came right back out the, the, the other side. Um, yeah, it, it's 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 lost me right now. So I'll. I'll keep... well, I was going to say that, you know, the thing is, is that we take on so much of that guilt and, and it's so small that you know we keep being told like well you just have the willpower right and it has nothing to do with willpower you know um the, the overeating allows uh, the food addicted person to avoid dealing with those threatening emotions you know such as perceived failure powerlessness uh inferiority and replace it with guilt and shame and sometimes it's almost comfortable to us those emotions and and you know they think it's lack of willpower but tr the truth is we're using food to defend ourselves against the pain in our life and and um it becomes a drug and you know we need help 
and like you say, when it gets past when your life, number step one, right? When your life becomes unmanageable, there's something wrong and we have to do something about it. And, and I hate it when I see people lose their lives. They get, they lose the weight and they think they're getting their life together. And then all of a sudden this come and kicks them on the butt. And they, and they're wondering like, Maybe. why, you know, and, and I agree, Jamie, like you said, you think you were probably had the, you know, the, the thing with the alcohol before, but when you take the food away, you find out whatever it is that you're going to jump to. And I, like I said, I'm so grateful that alcohol didn't do it for me. I'm so grateful. Yeah, where I was going, honey, I, I was I was thinking about the, the number one, the concept of self-medicating that, that, that essentially that we were doing, but also wrapped up around the definition of, of, um, of an addiction being something that we um, we think we can't stop or it, the, it's so much right. easier for us to follow the addictive path than it is for us to make the, the harder choice, which is mm-hmm. not do it. And, um, but what we know yeah. is yeah. And an awful lot of us have been able to, you can stop, you can make a difference. The other, one of the other quotes that Dr. Linden talks about in the, in the pleasure is that once we're diagnosed with a disease, once we understand that we have got this issue, it's up to us to manage it, just like a heart attack. Once you're diagnosed with that, it's up to you, the patient, to manage your behaviors to, to, to deal with it. The same thing with the addiction. Once you have realized, I've got an addiction, now it's up to me to make the choices I need to make in order to to deal with that issue, bad addiction. Absolutely. Well, and, I, was uh, I was gonna say real quick, I, there was a, a woman that wrote me and she was like, she had gotten weight loss surgery, she'd lost all her weight, she was ready to go out and party and socialize. And she had a husband, a gorgeous man, who loved her fat, skinny, whatever. She had the perfect man, okay? But she told me she wanted to be 21 again. And she wanted to go out and party with the young guys. And I said, look, that might be kind of fun for a couple of weeks, but I said, one day you're going to wake up and find out he snores too, and he maybe won't even have a job. And the thing is, is that you're just looking for that high, you know, that, that passion and that fun. And, and I think one of the most important things we have to learn, and I, I think in, in recovery, is being grateful for what we have, you know, because if we obsess over all the things that we're looking over the fence to the greener grass thing, then we never get there. And we never appreciate what we have because we don't often think about what we, the people that would give anything to be us. We're all obsessing on the people that have stuff that we don't have. So we just don't even enjoy what we have. Lost your voice there, girlfriend. Lost your voice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can't hear you. you. There we go. Okay. You're good. You're good. Jamie. Okay. I got you now, though. I can hear you. We can hear you now. Okay. You know, thinking, somebody asked the question, well, where is freedom? Freedom is acknowledging what is. Freedom comes from, first of all, saying, this is a problem for me and I need help. And then finding ways to take the blinders off so that you can, you are free then to experience all that's going around you in life. Because under any addiction, whether it's sex or gambling or food or alcohol or whatever it is, underneath every addiction, the core feeling that we carry is shame. And in addition to shame, there's anger, there's hurt, there's sadness, there's grief. And the freedom comes from addressing losses from your life that have never been addressed and grieving them, getting rid of all the feelings. I call it cleaning out your emotional closet so that you are yeah. free to experience life in the present and not try to avoid feelings or any kind of ick you're carrying around with you. So freedom comes from cleaning your emotional closet and dealing with things you, you maybe not want, have not wanted to deal with or felt before. That For me, that has been so true. Once I, once I got sober, once I started to realize what was behind it and took care of some of those, some of those core issues, the one thing that I realized that happened, and had I not, number one, stopped drinking, number two, dealt with the food issues, 
the one thing I never would have experienced is the core joy that I now have that I never even knew was possible to have. And getting, oh, yeah. rid, getting yeah. rid of the addictions is what allows that to come through. I love that you said that because that is exactly why I do the work that I do because I found a joy that I never knew was possible in small little things. The example yeah. I use so often is my little daughter coming down in the middle of the night when she was a little one and I'm studying, studying and she's, she asked me if I would rock her. And in that five minutes of rocking that child, I felt like I experienced more joy than some people literally do in a lifetime. And that's what I want to help other people find. But you've got to get rid of the crap that, Absolutely. you know, the obsession yep. with food, the obsession with shopping, the obsession with recipes, the, obs the you know, it's like wearing blinders. It and is. so removing them gives you freedom. Yvonne, what were you gonna say? Thank you. Thank you for saying the thing about the recipes too, because it, it's amazing how people will get just really tunnel vision on whatever it is. And, uh, you know, like I, I call, you know, I know some people like to post pictures of their food, but I call that food porn. And, and I cannot watch the shows on TV that show all the cooking. And I just can't because, uh, and I used this term last month, as I said, I can no longer have sex on a plate. And so I just have really, boring food. It, it, it's nourishment. It's not uh, fat, salt, and sugar. It's not the three points of the compass. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and it's, and it's boring, but I look to other things in my life to get that pleasure from. Food is fuel. It's just like putting gas in the car, you know, so it's not exciting to me. I If, if I could eat really exciting, great, but I can't. I can't eat just one, so I don't eat any. And I know that I am kind of extreme on that end, but it's what works for me. And I just say again, if what you're doing isn't working, try something different or seek help. We, we all have a path that we need to find on how we're going to deal with our addictions and, and how we are going to manage our addictions. And avoidance is a good, is, is something that's very helpful at times. I still avoid certain aspects of the, of the grocery store. I just don't, go down those aisles if i can you know if if, if i can yeah, right? there's just no need to even and, and I, bring it up. I was going to say we over a comment and i saw where um uh laura was talking about the sheep the same thing over and over and the, our other laura laura selfie was talking about this well both of them were talking about you know you got to get i believe that you got to get the crap junk out of your house you know it's just because even though I'm almost 15 years out and I still have maintained my weight, I don't need that stuff in my house at night because I really could accidentally mess up. You know, it's funny. I was at the OAC thing a um, year before that. No, I don't know. A couple of years ago, whenever and we were talking at a table of this discussion and I told the lady to get the stuff out of her house and she goes, well, the problem is I have car keys. And I said, well, then. Uh, do you have a friend or a neighbor? She goes, well, my best friend lives across the street. And I said, if you have to, give them your keys when you get home from work. You know, what? It, it may be ridiculous, but you've got to do, because you're trying to get your brain in the place where it starts to retrain itself. And you can't do that unless you start doing it. So, it, like, creating a habit. It takes 21 days, you know, you switch over, you will lose the craving for the crappy stuff and start to crave the good stuff if you give your brain a chance to learn it. But if you keep falling back to the crappy stuff, it can't ever quite get straightened out. Okay. Yes, and uh, Laura Preston just said some need abstinence, and I'm one of those. Yeah, you know, and I had a woman contact Go ahead, Jamie. Well, what I was going to say with food, abstinence is a, is a very complicated and difficult concept because what are you going to stay away from? You've got to have very, very right. specific foods that you're going to probably totally avoid, such as sugar, such as fat, such as the salt. And particularly the combination of those that we know will just trigger all kinds of bad behaviors. You know, yep. Laura, earlier you mentioned the Oprah thing. Were you referring to the Tick Hardy program, Addicted to Food? Yes. Yes. 
That was an amazing program. Does anyone have, know if that's available oh, to watch? Yes. As a matter of fact, I have a, I have a blog post that's called um, something about um, explaining food addiction. Here's explaining food addiction. And I, I, I got an article from a woman. I didn't catch her name. I tried to go back and find her, and I couldn't. But it was uh, five easy things that were great. And then in that same blog post, I put a link to the video of that show where the woman is throwing up from withdrawal. So yes, it is it is available. You can find it because I checked the link today and it's still good. Yeah, and if you can post that right. on your Facebook page or something and we can all four okay. people. But that program, Addicted to Amazing, and I contacted Tenny McCarty yesterday and oh. I'm, I'm going to ask her to be on this, uh, the podcast so she can share her, you know, her beliefs and her experiences with so many people, but that was an amazing program. I really enjoyed that. But I was going to say I had a woman contact me yesterday. She was a patient of mine who moved to another state and she texted me and she told me that she feels like she's gone to the other end of the continuum. You know, a lot, most issues are on a continuum. She said she's so rigid about food and she doesn't want to eat. And she, and I said, it's the same issue, other end of the continuum. That means you haven't dealt with the, it's just like the whack-a-mole addiction that we're talking about. You know? <laughs> yeah. 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 It sure is. Because, yeah. you know, while some people may uh, perceive what I do as that sort of thing, it's not for me. It's easier because it's black and white. I don't have to think about it. There's a great saying that 100% um, is great, but 99% is a bit. And that means that if you do something 99% of the time, that 1% can really bite you in the butt. Because yeah. how big is that 1%? So for me, when I do the things, you know, it's black and white. It's easy. It's just part of my day. It's just, like I said, it's fuel. So I put gas in my car. I ate. No big deal. I've done it. It's over with. And I don't, I do have one little habit that I'll do sometimes, even though there's nothing in the refrigerator. When I'm really, really stressed, every once in a while, I'll go and open up the refrigerator door and just look. There's nothing there I can use. <laughs> and it's that old behavior of that, you know, that makes me feel better, I guess. Searching, yeah. You know, but then I think I, I actually have, I, maybe it's a maturity or maybe I have a really good memory of what it feels like when I really blow it. Sure. And when I blew it over and over, and of course I know, Jamie, when you said you've been on every diet on earth, I did too. Um, you know, that thing about, well, you, you blow it a little bit and then you say, okay, well, I'm just going to go ahead and eat everything I've missed for the last two weeks because I blew it today, right? right? And I played that game it, like we all did. But I, yep, I did every one of those diets and some of them I shouldn't have because it really could have really hurt my body. One of the things that I that I established, not, not established, but that I learned in, in dealing with my addictions, is I have a little pouch in here and the things that are in that pouch are not on my menu anymore. So it's sugar. It's in that. It's in that pouch now. It's the high fats that are in that pouch. Pouch right now. So I'm kind of like you in a way, Yvonne, That I there's a limited menu that I have. I know what that menu is before I walk into a restaurant. I know what that menu is before we go to the grocery store. And but we'll do a lot of variety within that. We still have enjoyment wrapped up around food. It's just a limited menu of foods. And if it's not on the menu, you just ignore ignore that piece of it. Well, right. on top of it, I'm vegetarian also. Well, that was and a lot of people are kind of misguided about that. They don't realize that um, I can eat a whole lot more food because I eat a lot of vegetables. Yeah. Um, and people always, they're freaking out. Says, okay, uh, if you come over, what can you eat? I said, there's so many things I can eat. I can find something to eat at any restaurant, any restaurant. Just take me there. I'm fine. I'm not going to die if I don't eat the same thing you guys are eating, or even if I eat it all. It doesn't matter. I want to be there for the company and having a good time and being grateful for right now. Right now. And what you guys are talking about is how, the how do we overcome this addiction to food and how do we overcome addiction? And it's you're, you're talking about being committed. No matter what, I am committed. No matter where I go, no matter how, when I travel, if I'm on vacation, I am committed to my recovery and I am willing to put forth the effort 
required to get what I say I want. It's a function of right. choices, and we're always making choices, and we can make the right choice, and it's just as easy to make the right choice as, as it is the wrong. We have a concept in, in, a, in the smart recovery that it takes about five years, but there is the concept of exiting where the new behavior becomes more highly probable than the old. It doesn't mean you'll, you won't slip or relapse or anything like that. It just means that the new behavior is much more probable. And you don't have to constantly think about it. And you get, you get right. Things right. constantly on your mind. The new habits are, are, are healthy habits and they work. I was, I was going to ask Connie because <clears throat> I've tried to explain to people about, you know, going back and dealing with those things in your childhood and I, and I often say, find a family of origin therapist. And I'm just going to say, Connie, would you explain what that is? Yes. And I do the absolute same thing. I tell people, find somebody who understands family systems. Because addiction, whether it's food addiction or alcohol and drugs or whatever it is, it's a family systems disease and it requires family recovery. You know, if you're, if you're, if you've got a family, you're teaching them how to eat. You're teaching them what's acceptable and what's not acceptable behavior. You're teaching them to get out and exercise or not. You need a family systems therapist or someone who understands family of origin. Family of origin simply means the family you grew up in because almost everyone who suffers from any kind of addiction has endured some sort of trauma or loss or abuse or shaming kinds of experiences in childhood. Now, again, that doesn't mean we're gonna blame your parents for what you've done with your life. That's not what it's about. What it's about is saying, this is what happened in my life. Good, bad, all of it. This is how I felt as a child when that happened. And this is how it's affecting my adult life so that we can learn to live as healthy adults and not let the child that was hurt or damaged or upset or shamed or abused interfere with our adult relationships, interfere with our healthy lifestyles. And that's what a family of origin therapist is, somebody who understands family systems. Mm -hmm. Or find someone who is an addictions therapist because they all understand family systems. Okay, I didn't know I could ask for that. So I, I, I often, you know, and I'm amazed sometimes when people when I say, "Do you have access to therapy?" And they go, "Yeah." <laughs> ah! <laughs> Take it, use it. Because a lot of us don't. Absolutely. And then the one, and those of who don't, there's OA, there's places, you know, like what you do, Jamie. It's awesome because there is help out there. Whether you, you know, if, if you do it, I do all of mine online. I don't go to a physical support group. Um, because I'm just way too busy online. But whatever works for you, if you need to be at the face-to-face -face place, do. But like I said last month on the Connie Cast, please be careful of the groups that you involve yourself in because if it, they're not kind, if they're not giving you that unconditional support and a soft place to fall, you need to go. Because that's just a functional group and they're just, even if it's OA or whatever, it doesn't mean it's perfect just because it's under the auspices of OA. And that's another thing, too. I did find with OA that you have some that are kind of, uh, well, that they're WLS friendly and some of them are not. So you have to find the one that works for you. Absolutely. You know, a supportive environment whenever you, wherever you go is, is very, very important to the whole process. And that's one of the things I like about our meetings is that they are extremely supportive. We do a lot of crosstalk. We're there for each other. And it's about how do we deal with the various – in, in the room at any one time, we'll have people with – most of them have multiple addictions. Foods, in, in a lot of our cases, there's food, but it's alcohol, drugs, and a number of process addictions all at the same time. And we're all talking about it. And guess what? The same processes for dealing with it work regardless of what the addiction is. I just right. saw something on the slide. I hope it doesn't go away. Is it Tyrana? She said the biggest thing, oh, is, is to learn between the uh, urge and the action. Did I get that in time? Uh, she said to learn the difference between, or to learn the time between the urge and the action. And, he, and I think that's what I was saying about, I can project myself into what I felt like afterwards before. Right. Well, I don't want to do that. 
don't we all wish we'd never done it after we did it, right? So if we can step into that place and say, okay, I don't want that pain. No, I'm trying to avoid pain right now by using my addiction. Um, can we think about, can we step into that, that moment afterwards and go, okay, do we really want to beat ourselves up and do that like we've always done? Or do we want to change it this time? And get to find what works for you. Get busy. Find, call a friend. Just watch them. Whatever you've got to right. do. We can actually change it before if you can begin to realize what the trigger is that leads to the urge. If you, yes, if you let it, it get to the urge, sometimes it becomes harder to control it. It becomes harder to deal with it. But if you can understand what your thought process is, and therapy helps an awful lot, for, and counseling helps an awful lot with that. But if you can be aware of what your thought processes are that get you to the trigger points, you can a trigger you can slough away in a matter of a set couple of seconds. An urge will take yeah. minutes, a, a number of minutes yeah. to, to power yeah. through. But if you can grab it before that, before it becomes an urge and understand what your triggers are, you'll be, you can beat the game. Uh, Connie, I hope two, of the thing, two of the things that I hear you guys talking about that I absolutely love are planning. You know, you're talking about relapse prevention. Exactly. What are the things that I have to do to avoid triggers? You know, Jamie, you said you avoid sections of the grocery store. That's beautiful. You know those are places you don't want to be. Exactly. Yvonne, you do a lot of your recovery stuff online because that works for you. Right. So I, one of the things that drew me to both of you and Laura and Laura and so many people in the community is this inclusiveness. It doesn't have to be AA. It doesn't have to be Celebrate Recovery. It doesn't have to be OA. It doesn't have to be any one program. Find what works for you, but find it, find put the it. effort into and do it and, and make a plan. Make a plan. These are the things that trip me up at holidays. These are the things that trip me up when I go to the grocery store. These are the things that trip me up when I go visit my family. What do I have prepared if I find myself in trouble in any of these situations. And the other thing that you're saying that is um, so vital is changing your thinking. The thinking is probably the number one key exactly. to changing all of this. And I'm doing a 12 week group in Augusta where I live. And it, it's just an amazing group of people and they're working so hard and we're really cleaning out that emotional closet and moving into how do I be a healthy adult given that I have the disease of obesity, given that I have the tendency toward this or that or this or that, because we all have the ability, but most of us didn't learn the tools. Exactly. So you gotta go somewhere where you can learn the tools and practice them with one another. We have the power to deal with, the power to deal with these things. We have to find the motivation. And there's lots of tools that we can utilize out there to find that motivation to know that we it's, it's not just wanting to change it's knowing why we want to change it's our core values and how does this addiction get in the way of us achieving our core values and when we can find those things and be motivated then dealing with urges falls into place understanding our, our thinking and our problem solving processes begin to fall into place particularly when we no longer have that addiction to fall back on to mask yeah. those problems or to overshadow, to avoid the problems. Yeah. Then we can find balance yeah. in life and it's in that life balance that we can find that those court, the core joy that we, I talked about a little bit a little while ago and Connie that you were talking about. It's, it's amazing, <laughs> it really is. Yeah. You know, you said core values. One of the things that we do every single week in this 12 week program is is define our meaningful matters is what I call them. Same thing. Ooh, it's I like core that. values. Yeah. And we do Yeah, we do in the different areas of life. It's like with my physical health, what are two things that mean the most to me in regard to my spiritual life or my work life or my relationships? Mm -hmm. Find two things that matter the most to you. And then with every choice you make, you ask yeah. yourself this question. Will doing this, whatever this is, move me closer to or further from 
my meaningful matter, that which I define as most meaningful to me. And we want to move closer to the things we value the most, right? So that's a very simple tool to help keep you on track. I, I just noticed, I can remember this, I think uh, Laura Preston just wrote um, that would you be eating, would you eat the thing that you're eating in front of someone else? Because secrecy can be a really bad thing. And I think that's great because I had my days when I, I hid cookies and the towels and uh, I did it all. <laughs> but, you know, it's, um, that's, that's really good. You know, would you eat this in front of someone else? You know, of course, we know even before we ask that question whether we really, you know, whether we've made a good choice or not. And, you know, we have people that will argue whether is there is there bad food or is it not, is, you not call it bad food. It, I think that's just kind of getting down to, right. You know, it doesn't really matter, just whatever works for you. I look at, at the junk food as bad food. I, bad food to me is food that has no nutritional value. There's no reason for, I, I haven't had egg pie cookies, candy in 15 years. I don't even remember what it tastes like. I don't forget. I don't even remember. So I've totally forgotten it. Don't crave it. And but I guarantee you, I had I, my guilty pleasure was quarter pounder with cheese. And I know that if I went and took one bite, it would all come rushing back. And why would I do that to myself? It's just crazy. So I had my last one. It was great when I had it. I don't need another one. And I just don't need to go there. I love what formerly I always said. I was gonna say, besides, says, I'm getting old, and I, I need to, you know, do good things for this body. You know, <laughs> right. we all need to do good things for our body. It says, feel yeah. self self definition is important. Do I define? How do I define myself? You know, do I define myself as someone who's working to be healthy? You know, am I the sort of person who eats this stuff now? Can I afford to be? Well, it depends on what your meaningful matters are, right? What are your values? Who do I want to be? Now, here's where I think. The psychology comes in because I think those wounds from childhood do a number on our self-definition, right? If you're told for years and years and years or treated in such a way that um, you're given the message, you're not important, you're not worthy, you're not, you know, you, it's very hard without some help and a whole lot of self-talk and a whole lot of effort and a whole lot of practice for that to become the most predominant thought. And if you think if those old tapes are what drives your bus, it's gonna be hard for you to stick with a healthy pattern. That's why you need family of origin therapy. Yeah, cause you have to- I knew it. We need to break those patterns up and move into new patterns. And yeah, you know, before you were talking about kind of the, remember making a plan well, an awful lot of that whole dealing with some of the old issues is how am I going to plan forward and to avoid those types right. of similar types of occurrences. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a whole there's a whole school of thought and there's a whole lot of research done on relapse prevention planning. And I think there you know you can make it a happier sounding term than relapse prevention, but you know, staying on, really? time, you know, however you want yeah. to call it, but you've got a plan to do this. Exactly. You know, it, it's not going to just happen. I utilize visualization. You know, I, so when I, before oh. I go into, before I go into a restaurant or go in, I visualize what I'm going to order so that mm -hmm. I, it's, it's the decisions already made. I don't really even have to look at the menu very much. I just find the menu item that, <laughs> that is what I had already dreamed of. And, and visualized. And the same thing with the alcohol aspect of it. I visualize myself ordering the other drink that I'm not going to, not what I'm not going to drink, but what I am going to drink. The, mm -hmm. yeah. the unsweet yeah. tea or the coffee or the, or the iced tea or whatever, you know, whatever it is I'm going to do. Yeah. I'm going so, you know, and, and, to share something with you. I, I'm kind of a dork and I like, I like to learn. <laughs> no, I'm not kind of a dork. I'm a huge dork, but I like being a dork. I don't do that in a self pity way. I just like to learn a lot of stuff. And so over over Christmas, I was listening to these CDs that I buy at conferences and stuff. And 
this one was actually put out by um i don't know if it was national geographic or one of those big organizations but it was on the brain and they were talking yeah. about how they train navy seals and jamie you reminded me of this one when you talked about visualization but one of the things they were talking about how they how they try to train Navy SEALs to not be so reactive to fear and to kind of get through that. There are four techniques. And I'm like, come on, this is exactly what we do in therapy. These people are just locked down in it for hours and hours and hours on day after day after day after day. But the techniques are, hey, surprise, 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 self-talk. I can, I will, I'll get through this. Da, da, da. Visualization. You practice something before you experience it because you have already predetermined the outcome. Athletes exactly. use this all the time. They practice making free throws, perfect shots, perfect shots. Visuals, visualize yourself having a boundary setting conversation with friends or with family or whomever it is. But visualization is a wonderful tool. Another one was deep breathing because when we get fearful or when we get anxious or agitated, we do that breathe, that shallow breathing. You want to, want to do the fight or flight thing. So just learning to breathe deeply and slowly will slow you down. You can think better when you're moving more slowly internally. And then the last one was goal setting. And they set goals. I will get through the next hour. I will make it to lunch. They don't say, I'm going to be clean and sober for the next 30 years. Right? Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, the um, I had another one. The goal setting is extremely important. For matter of fact, that's how we end every one of our meetings is we set goals for we we set goals for the we set goals for the week. Awesome. Awesome. Yes. And that's yeah, why I, mean, I, I know. I was uh, going to say I know Connie's heard me tell this story before, but on the visualization, they did an experiment with three basketball teams. And they all shot free throws and they took their scores. And so the first team uh, didn't practice at all. The second team only visualized shooting the gun, shooting the gun, shooting the gun. The third team actually did the well, The one that um, did the best was obviously the ones that actually practiced, but just barely under them were the ones that visualized getting the free throws in by practicing. And, you know, I believe that you have to see it to believe it. And if you don't see it, you're not going to believe it. Right. Right. All right. Anybody got any questions out there that you want to have answered? Experiences that they said will, or that you want to. I will post that uh, link on my um, Facebook page um, to the food addiction, um, the tinny thing. But I think it's really important people to see that it is so incredible as well as her book i mean i loved her book right she is so awesome <clears throat> i was going to say um also with the um the sugar thing i don't allow myself more than 10 grams of processed sugar in anything and you know, it's hard to find yogurt without the and to fit in that but right. i just i just you know it does it it's just it's well, i can say it's black and white that's a no can't have it and I don't dump. I mean, well, I maybe dumped in 15 years. I may have dumped uh, less than a, uh, five times, maybe definitely no more than 10. I, it's been so rare. And a lot of it is because I don't eat the things that make you dump. I don't eat too fast. And, and you know, that's just really important. And the other thing that's really, really, really important is to eat breakfast. And I went for years thinking, okay, today, how long can I go without eating, right? And and then by the time I did, it was like, well, you know. So if you eat breakfast, it keeps your metabolism going because otherwise it's going to stall. Because your body starts thinking, oh, my God, the, the, the winter, you know, is coming and we've got to store up. And it does. And so if you have to eat five smaller meals, that's way better. You know, but don't be, don't go long periods of time without eating because, you know, you know the saying about what is it? Um, uh, what's the the acronym? Um, um, hungry, angry, lonely, lonely. tired. Yeah. Oh. What is it? Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Oh, oh that's yeah. what I was trying to go. Because oh. if we don't, eat, we will end up. We'll end up hungry. You know, and then when we get hungry, what do we get? We get anxious. 
Crabby. <laughs> Angry. You, yeah, you, you, oh boy. Yvonne, you've done a great job, I think, of of defining how these behaviors become habits that are good habits for you to do and if they become easier easier to, to manage i can't, i'm like you i can't remember the last time i dumped because the stuff it's in that bag it's not on my menu anymore it, you know we all have our little tools that that we utilize to make it work but over time it just becomes how you live your life that's right. I don't want to go. Right. <laughs> I think it's important to think note it's that you guys have both been yes. in recovery from whatever addiction for a long time. And long time. it has now become a way of life. It's, it's become, become a way of life. life. It's become a way of life. Why does that sound so bad? Does it sound so bad on your end? Does it sound so bad on your end? There's something going on on your end where you're hearing. Well, forget. I don't know what it is. Well, forget. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go by. 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 You know, it's not a function of willpower, and if we listen to the science that's out there, we understand the concepts of, of set point, of how your body yeah. is going to try to push itself to, to those higher weights, whether you want to or not. So it's not a function of willpower. It's really a function of understanding how you're going to change your life and, to, and, to, and, and making it so that it's no longer something you're trying to power through, but rather just becomes your way of living. I, right. Well, right. Well, I would say, you know, willpower is like we obviously have the willpower not to rob a bank, right? If we run out of money, do we go rob a bank? That's easy. That's, we have willpower. It's not will. When we we put that hold on, we're carrying it again. We all have the willpower. Is, to go ahead. Willpower is kind of about control. Recovery is about accepting that you don't have control. Go ahead, Jamie. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, we all had the willpower to, to power through short periods of time with diets. Mm -hmm. And we thought, you know, it's not a function that we had willpower or not, but it's a function of, and I agree with the control aspect of it, but you learn what it is you can control and you manage your, con you can, you make those choices that we can make and we can all make the right ones. Right. And what I was right. trying to say when that horrible echo came across is we all have made this a lifestyle. But when you're new to this, it's impossible to do by yourself. It just simply is. Because I, what I view therapy as is just a new way, a, a way, a place to learn healthier new skills. That's what therapy is yeah. about. It's having a safe place to clean the emotional closet and a place to learn some healthier new skills that make your life work better. It's not about going because you're crazy or whatever. It's about, we go to school to learn new languages. We go to school to learn, you know, how to do things. That's what therapy is. It's learning how to live a healthier life that works better for you. And it helps you do the planning that you were talking about before, because you can talk through those events that could be coming up in your life and how am I going to go about dealing with those? Right. We all have right. we all have issues that come up on a on a day-to-day a -day basis. And how we're gonna navigate those issues and not fall back to the addiction is all about us making it through on a long-term basis. And remember, weight loss surgery, medical weight loss, whatever, weight loss programs do not treat addiction. <laughs> No. You know, they just don't. They do not treat addiction. No. So if you want to stay in recovery and not have whack-a-mole addiction run in your life, then if you have weight loss surgery, get into some therapy and work through whatever or just have the support so that you don't turn to another. It's kind of like we chop people's legs off and tell them to go swim. Right. You know, exactly. there's so much more to it. Our counselor, when I, when I had my surgery, our counselor said, you got to remember, it's not brain surgery. 
it's stomach right. surgery. <laughs> so yeah, it's a I'm new right. tool. We've got to learn how to use it, but it's a lifelong process of dealing with the addictions and a dealing with uh, the Deborah, Deborah Bunch was talking about that, you know, sometimes um, it's by the hour and that we have to eat food. We, should, we have to make choices. And I hear that a lot where people will say, well, I have to eat, you know, we have this addiction that, you know, uh, it's like saying, okay, if you have an al if you have an alcohol addiction, it would be like saying, okay, three times a day, you have to take a sip of beer. However, you can look at food as either, like I say, I look at it as the bad food, the good food. So I don't have to eat the bad food. I can eat the good food because I have to eat food. Yeah. So I might say that's sort of like maybe eating uh uh, or drinking non-alcoholic beer, which I think is kind of a bad idea anyway. But you know, it's <laughs> it's like why, why? But um, you know, I mean, we we can look at food and not say, well, I have to eat, so you know, I have to eat the bad stuff. So I have to eat the bad stuff. Okay. And there's and, a good question. I'm saying the people that can eat that one bite, great. Go ahead, finish up. Okay. Did you finish? What shall we do? Did you finish? wanted to say I think so <laughs> okay all right there's a question um, joy wants to know if I have workshops in a gut I think that's supposed to be in Augusta uh, I will uh -huh. do workshops anywhere <laughs> I have, <laughs> I have my computer I travel so I can do workshops anywhere but this online program that I'm doing that I really have a lot of love for almost as much as my book um, because I think it's really helping people and it's not me doing it. It's the people choosing to do the work. Um, so it, it's, it's a valuable tool to get people who are interested in putting forth the effort to really make some significant changes in their life. I will be glad to do an online one. Um, I'll open it up. Uh, I'll, I'll do that. I plan to do that. Maybe start it after master's week because master's week in Augusta, we all take off. So maybe, I could do that after yeah. that, but yes, I do this. I do this class in Augusta, and I love it. But I do workshops all over the country. So if you got enough people, contact me. I'll put my husband in, in touch with you, and we'll we can set something up. Um, but I, I wanted to say, I wanted to say thank you to you, Connie, and you, Jamie. I was so honored to be included in this, and thank you to the people that are listening, and thank you to the people that will hear this after the fact because I'm going to be everywhere but I want to say thank you so much for providing this you know this place this venue for us because this is absolutely one of the most important issues there is because I think if you don't get this fixed everything else is kind of band-aid and diet is a band-aid this is a band-aid this is the real core issue that's got to be fixed or none of the band-aids will work Jamie I agree Summarize and tell us whatever you want us to know about you, how to get in touch with you, how to, you know, what you want to promote. Give us what you got there, girl. <laughs> well, I'm not in the business of doing any of this. I don't blog. I don't do it. What I, what I do is I say get out there and be in groups if you, if you need that support. Uh, if you want to look at um, something as an alternative to a 12-step program, try Smart Recovery. Um, it, it is a it is a program. They have both an online presence and we do face to face meetings, which, which, which is what I do. And um, but mostly, I guess I want to say is if anybody wants to get a hold of me, uh, I think you've got my um, my link here for my on Twitter. I don't do Twitter very much, but I do a lot on Facebook. So feel free to look me up on Facebook, and um, you'll find out more about me than you probably ever wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. Yvonne, same to you. What do you want people to know? Um, uh, again, you can find me at bariatricgirl.com or bariatricgirl on Facebook. I have a public page there and do all my weight loss surgery on that. And um, I volunteer full time and I'm, I'm there to help. And I, I just, it's just so important that. Well, and I would say also, my blog, I, I'm not one of those bloggers that blogs every day. I blog when I feel like there's something really important to say. So it doesn't take long to get to my blog and read those. Um, uh, there's, you know, not an outrageous amount of, of posts there. 
And I particularly have one that talks about taking off regain glasses that I like a lot. So, um, but check that out, and uh, you can catch me in your place for bariatric girl. I do have one more thing I'd like to, I'd like to promote. Um, if for the, this isn't so much around the addiction aspect of it, but if, for those of you, if there's anybody on here who's looking for what what are the methods out there, what are the, are my options for weight loss? Go to the OAC, the Obesity Action Coalition, and we have all kinds of educational materials. I've been on the OAC board since its inception, and um, it's I'm prejudiced, but it's a fantastic organization. <laughs> there's, there's it, a is lot it is a wonderful organization. And so is the WSFA and um, Obesity yeah. Help. You know, get help wherever you feel at home. And I love both of you. I thank you. Um, I thank everybody who's been commenting on the side. I love your open-mindedness. Jamie, I connected with you right away. And Yvonne, for whatever reason, it took us a minute to sit down. But dang, girl, when we did, we could talk all day, right? So thank you both. It means thank a you. lot to me to have, to have other people on here who have wisdom and expertise and experience that I don't. And having people share, you know, who are participating it means so much because we all have have goodness and a piece of the puzzle to add that might just help somebody out in the right way on this day. So thank you, both of you, for being here. For everybody who's uh, watching, the Connie cast will be available on YouTube. <laughs> Von, you and your cast. <laughs> Keep doing the great work with the OAC that you've been doing. And everybody spread the, you know, the knowledge and the hope of recovery from food addiction and all other addictions. Thank you all for being with us tonight. And we will get this posted so soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good night, everybody. <laughs>